If you get one thing out of the workshop here today, I just want you to remember the word ear and the way that ear is spelled. Because if you're a leader in an organization, that little framework, that little catch, that little hint will help you immensely in your leadership communication. I've been working with contractors since 2004 and I am convinced that technical aptitude aside, what sets apart those who are highly successful from those who struggle is the ability of the leadership team to communicate effectively. Your construction company, if you are the leader of your construction company, for better or for worse, your company is a direct reflection of you and your ability to communicate with those whom you lead. And I'm going to tell you why that ear framework is very important here in a little bit. All right, 2019, $808 billion in construction. Is this how you feel right now? Yeah, a little bit stuffed? Okay, everybody's like that. All right. So, with that in mind, I'd like to share with you the seven attributes of the best contractor. I have a friend of mine. He's been in the construction industry for many years. The week before last, he got laid off. He got laid off. And I was blown away. And you know why he got laid off? Because the, the subcontractor that he was working for had a million dollars outstanding of retention, two million dollars of AR, and a bunch of AP, and a litigation that was going on with a, uh, a, a and a, believe me, if I told you the project, you would all know the project. I'm not going to, I'm going to spare the, uh, not the innocent, but I'm going to spare the, you know, the shame. If, you, if, if I told you the project, you would know it. It's locally here. This guy is a kick-ass project manager, a kick-ass estimator, right? He's been in the business for 30 years and he just got laid off in the midst of a booming economy. Is that possible? Absolutely. Typically, a lot of construction companies don't go out of business when there is a lack of work. It's when there's too much work and they can't execute it correctly. So seven attributes of the best contractors. They pursue niche work at which they are excellent and profitable. They deal with clients they know well. They work with project partners they trust. They maintain high quality, efficient construction work. They emphasize and demand safety. And they insist on timely payment for all dollars earned. Oh, one more. They have a financial cushion. <laughs> My friend was working for a company who worked with a client that they didn't know well. And they got into an issue with the client, and as a result of that, this company had to lay my friend off. Okay? That was the issue there. As you look at those seven attributes, what's one that you do very well, and what's one that you need to improve? Reflect on that for a moment. Think about the people who are up and coming in your organization. I'd like you to think about one of your direct reports. One of your direct reports. One of the direct reports that you have pinned some of your hopes on that this one will be the one that could potentially replace me, that could potentially carry on my legacy. I'd like you to think about that person for a moment and reflect upon how well they understand these seven attributes of the best and what you need to do to school them and to teach them in how to be an effective construction leader. Because a real leader is somebody who can help us overcome the limitations of our own individual laziness and selfishness and weakness and fear and get us to do better things than we ourselves can do on our own. That's from David Foster Wallace. We are surrounded by people who are lazy, selfish, weak, and afraid. Pretty motivational, huh? <laughs> One of those people is sitting in your seat. Okay? To one degree or another, we all have challenges in our lives. And the best leaders and the best individuals are the ones who are able to face those challenges and still overcome them. And that's what the legacy of your construction company depends upon. Admiral Nelson, the Battle of Trafalgar, 1805. It was the British against the French and the Spanish. This was the Napoleonic time, when Napoleon was aiming to invade England. Lots of people have always aimed to invade England. They haven't done a good job of it since about 1066. And there was a battle in the location of Trafalgar. Now, back in the day in these naval battles, how did they fight those battles? How, was, how did they figure out how to go about those battles? What was the strategy that they used? The strategy they used was they would line up two lines, my galleons against your galleons, my guns against your guns. We're going to blow the crap out of each other, and then we're going to get the ships close to each other, and we're going to jump on board one another's ships, and we're going to hack each other to, to death, right? 
Now, if the English had done that, they would have got completely wiped out by the Spanish because the Spanish and the French galleons were way more um, heavily armed and they were, were designed for that particular type of warfare. So Admiral Nelson came up with a different approach. His aim was the same. It was to achieve victory, but his approach to achieving victory was different. So let's take a look at that approach. Instead of going side by side, what Admiral Nelson and his, um, his uh, commanders did is they figured out a strategy where they would seek to cut the Spanish and the French lines in half because they had smaller, lighter boats, they were better shots, and the uh, soldiers on the boats were more efficient. So they want to cut the line in half so that they can board the boats and they can take out the Spanish. So the Battle of Trafalgar started. As a leader, Admiral Nelson did something extremely important. And I'd like you to think about your leadership specifically in terms of these things I'm going to share here. Number one, he had a clear command intent. They got together and they were clear on how they were going to execute this battle. There was no illusion about how they were going to do it. Number two, they had competence among the decision makers. In other, in other words, the admiral could delegate this particular task to his decision makers because he knew that they were competent. Now let me ask you, as a leader of your construction company, are you confident in the competence of the people that you are hoping will succeed you? I'd like you to think about your main successor. What is one thing that that person needs to improve on? What is one thing? If you, if you could wave a magic wand and 12 months from now, that individual has made significant progress in that one area. What is that one area? Okay. They had rich shared information about the battle space. Right? As we, as in construction, we understand that it's an information game. You can't make decisions unless you have the correct information. They got rich shared information about the battle space without cell phones, without Wi-Fi, without anything like that. Okay? And then they had trust between commanders at all levels. So they had relationship. They were the underdogs in this fight. And they had to approach the fight in a new way. But because there was a clear command intent, because there was competence, because they had rich shared information and trust between commanders at all levels, they had at least a shot at winning the fight. Think about the people who, you, um, who report to you. How many of them do you trust? How many of them do you trust? Something for you to reflect on there. Laura Ingalls Wilder, this earthly life is a battle, said Ma. It's always been that way, and it always will be. The sooner you make up your mind to that, the better off you are, and the more thankful you are for your pleasures. John Stump still here, did he leave? One thing John Stump did years ago is he encouraged me to read Little House on the Prairie to my kids. If you have little kids, and you haven't read that to them yet, and you're still in the age where they'll sit with you and you want, they'll want you to uh, read to them, read to them Little House on the Prairie. It's awesome. The reason I share the battle analogy and the reason I share this is because going back to this idea of grabbing your ear, it's something that's closely related to the battle of life that we face. Life is a battle. Life is a struggle. Life is challenging. And so that's why you have to be able to communicate these three messages in order to maximize your direct reports performance and secure your company's future. Now, the three messages that you need to communicate on a consistent basis are encouragement, accountability, and recognition. Grab your ear again. E is encouragement. A is accountability. R is recognition. If you walk away with one thing, if you're asking yourself, what as a leader should I be doing with my people on a regular basis? Number one, I should be encouraging them. Number two, I should be holding them accountable. And number three, I should be recognizing them. And the reason I have a military image there is because it's what I call comfort. You should be a comforter to your people. The word comforter is um, the where, where I get that from is in the Greek and Roman armies, in the Roman armies particularly and in the Greek, they had someone who, whose role was the paraclete or the comforter. Okay? And what the paraclete would do is he would go into battle with the soldiers and he would put them, his arm around them and he would say, you can do it. 
And that's what it means to encourage people. And as he, uh, they, they were going into battle, he would hold them accountable. And he would say, did you do it? And then after the battle, he would recognize them. And he would say, you did it. And those are the three messages you have to communicate on a consistent basis as a leader. Number one, you can do it. Number two, did you do it? Number three, you did it. I told you I wasn't a rocket scientist. Okay? We complicate a lot of things, but if we can simplify and be direct and be effective, it helps us in our leadership. So, again, think about that ear framework. Encouragement, accountability, recognition. You can do it. Did you do it? You did it. Those are the three messages you need to consistently communicate to those who you hope will take your place in the future. So I'd like you to either sketch it out or to think about it a moment. Think about your organizational chart. And I'd like you to think about your direct reports. Your direct reports. And the question we're going to ask today is who needs encouragement, who needs accountability, and who needs recognition? And my hope for you is that you will go out of this meeting today with a commitment to have at least one of those conversations with one of your direct reports. Either an encouragement conversation, an accountability conversation, or a recognition conversation. And I venture to say that if you're going to be an effective leader, these are conversations that you need to have with your people on a consistent basis. If you haven't held someone accountable for their performance in the last month or the last week or two, you're missing the boat in terms of your leadership. If you haven't specifically recognized someone for the work that they're doing in one way or another in the last month, you're missing the boat on your leadership. Okay, so, how do you encourage people? If you're going to encourage them, you have to have the right mindset behind what you're doing. You have to be able to direct them in the right actions, and you have to show them the why behind it. People are desperate to know the why. We saw earlier that the church construction is way down, right? Right? Church construction's way down, but we're still spiritual human beings, right? And that deep sense of why, that deep sense of commitment is absolutely essential for people to, to excel. So what I'd like you to do is to think about encouraging people in terms of their performance. High performance is concentrating on the few tasks that if done with excellence will really make a difference in the results of your job and in the performance of the company. So think about that direct report. Think about the direct report now. What are the top three outcomes that they need to achieve in order to succeed in their role? Think about that for a moment. If you want to write that down, you can. Think about those top three outcomes. I was talking to one of my clients just this week. He's a young guy. He's up in Reno. They just opened an office up there. Um, he's getting distracted by a whole bunch of stuff. So I said, okay, what are your top three outcomes? And he was really fast. Number one, develop relationships. Number two, bid and win work. Number three, build it successfully. Boom. <laughs> Those are the top three outcomes. Nice and clear. Think about your direct report. What are the top three outcomes that they are expected to achieve? Okay, now, think about someone who's perhaps in charge of building, one of your superintendents or one of your foremen. They've got to be safe, they've got to be fast, and they've got to do it at high quality. That's just an example. But think about your direct report, the top three outcomes. Now, I want you to pick the most important outcome that they're supposed to achieve. The most important outcome. What is the most important outcome that that direct report is supposed to achieve? Okay? Now, Let's roll with that for a moment here. Pick the top three actions or tasks that lead to that most important outcome. Okay, so think about the most important outcome and then the top three tasks that lead to that most important outcome. Okay, so you've got your most important outcome. You've got your most important task that leads to that most important outcome. And you're thinking about that direct report who you're putting your hopes into. This is the question that you then ask. In what specific ways, and you ask them to answer this, in what specific ways can I improve my performance of this task? If you're going to be able to encourage them and say you can do it, 
You've got to be able to give them the opportunity to think through in what specific ways can I improve my performance of that task. Now that question there, what's the most important word in that question? Specific. Specific. Because what you want them to do is to be very granular and very action-oriented in what they're going to do to improve their performance of that task in order to achieve that most important outcome. And you as a leader, if you're able to sit down with someone and walk them through the outcomes you expect from them, walk them through the tasks that lead to that outcome, talk with them about how they're going to improve their performance of those tasks, then you have the right to look them in the eye and say, you can do it. You can do it. That's how you're going to be able to encourage them. So what I'd like you to do is think about your org chart real quick. Perhaps that one direct report. Who needs encouragement? Who needs encouragement? Who has potential, but they're a little bit shaky in their performance? And you need to sit down with them and make sure they're crystal clear on exactly what they need to do in order to achieve high performance. Sit down with them. Identify their outcomes, their tasks that lead to the outcome. Pick the most important task and get them to think about how can I improve my performance of that task in the next 30 days. And then look them in the eye and say, you can do it. Okay, let's talk about accountability. Holding people responsible for their actions and outcomes appropriate to their authority and within their realm of responsibility. What's your biggest challenge with holding people accountable? Timeliness. Timeliness. Interesting. Tell me about that. I think sometimes things can get away from us for uh, time can go by. You didn't realize someone didn't do what they were supposed to do, and then by the time by the time you realize that you haven't been holding someone accountable, it's kind of too late. Right. Because you you've said it, so you assume they're going to do it. That timeliness is ex that's excellent. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Gauging the level of performance to hold them accountable to. Yeah. That's very interesting. And, and how do you do that gauging process? How does that take place? <laughs> yes. That's interesting. I'm going to talk to, I'm going to speak to that here in a little bit specifically. Be, um, uh, that's very good. I'm, I got that. Okay. Anyone else? Struggle with accountability. How many of you people are uncomf uh, uncomfortable having accountable conversations? A little bit. Some of you may not be. Some of you are, are good with it, right? Just straight up, did you do it? Did you do it? But some of us are a little uncomfortable with those accountable conversations. Okay. I want to go back to this delegation piece because it speaks to what you just said here. Here's why we don't delegate. Number one, we like being the hero. How many of you are heroes out here? I know they're all out. You guys are all heroes. Hey, listen. I know some of you guys, man, you guys are heroes to me because you guys have kicked some ass and you've started awesome companies and you've built them and you have a positive impact upon this community in a tremendous way that you probably, you kind of have an inkling to, but you really, you know, you've had such a massive impact. You're heroes. And you know what you specialize in? Someone has a problem. Dun, 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 dun. Here I come to save the day. Right? You're a hero. And your hero-ness is one of your weaknesses. Because your people love that you're the hero, right? They love when Superman comes flying in and rescues the damsel in distress or the dude in distress, whatever the case is. And you just love that buzz that you get from being the hero. And that buzz will hinder you from being able to pass your company on to other people. Another issue is you're a perfectionist. Nobody can do it as well as you, and you are probably correct. Nobody can. But that's not the point. Who decides what's good enough in terms of construction? Pardon? The customer does. I'm not saying that so that we would lower our expectations or our standards or anything like that. But at the end of the day, the customer decides what's good enough. And you may be able to do it better than 90% of the people in your organization, but can they do it well enough so that the customer is satisfied with it? And then another issue is, is we don't trust other people. Because the last time I delegated it to someone, they screwed it up, and I had to take it over anyway. 
So if you struggle with being a hero or being a perfectionist or not trusting people, then it's going to be tough for you to hold them accountable for tasks because you'll never give them stuff to begin with. And that's why delegation is a key part of accountability. So here's a quick delegation framework. Choose what tasks you're willing to delegate. Pick the best person to delegate them to. Give clear assignments. Set a completion date. Delegate responsibility and authority, not just the task. I want you to think of one thing that you're doing right now that you should not be doing, that someone else should be doing. That every time you do it, you're like, I shouldn't be doing that. That's their job. But because you're a hero or a perfectionist or you don't trust them, you don't go through the hard work necessary to help them to figure out how to do it. Okay? What's that one task that you need to delegate? Get off your plate. Don't do it anymore. I remember there was a breakthrough in my house one, one day. I went up to my wife. I said to my wife, this was in like November. I said, I said, I said Nelia, I am not doing the dishes anymore. I, I did, I did. How did it go? It's, go? it's going really awesome. I'll tell you why. We have kids. <laughs> we have kids, right? And I know I can do the dishes better than my kids. I've been doing them for years. I know my wife can do the dishes better than my kids. She's been doing them for years. But we have kids. The little rascals can do the dishes themselves. So I told her in November, I am not doing the dishes anymore starting January 1st. It was really cool. Little line in the sand, a little bit of time so that she could, you know, work with the kids a little bit more. Kids are doing the dishes 80% of the time, right? My wife's still helping out, but okay. The point is this. When you're delegating, you've got to ask this. Am I clear about what I'm delegating? Does the other person understand what I've asked them to do? Number two, are they capable? And that kind of goes to what you were saying there. Are they actually capable of doing what I'm asking them to do? Do they have the, the capability? And number three, do they have the capacity? How many of you have that person in your organization that you just love delegating to because they're the ones who will stay late and get everything done? And you just delegate, 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 delegate. But at a certain point, they get overcapacitated and their performance goes down. So when you're delegating, you have to take into account, are you clear, are they capable, and do they have the capacity? Because if you don't do it, that's the difference between delegation and abdication. So when you're having an accountable conversation with them, you want to ask them three things. Did you do it? If not, why not? How can I help? Those are the three questions that you should be having in an accountability conversation. Did you do it? If not, why not? How can I help? That's simply how you hold people accountable. So think back to your org chart. Who needs accountability? Who in your organization do you need to have a conversation with and you know that you've needed to have a conversation with them for a number of months and you yet, you're yet to have that conversation? Identify that person and put a little A next to their name. Whoever needs an encouragement, put an E next to their name. Whoever needs accountability, put an A next to their name. I was working for a company for a while and a uh, great entrepreneurial company. Really enjoyed working there. And one year, I was the marketer of the year. I was the only guy in the marketing department. <laughs> <laughs> Just think about the chemicals that are released in us when we're recognized. Those same chemicals are released in others when you recognize them for the work that they do. And so if you're going to be effective at recognition, you've got to be specific. Specific. You've got to be personal, and you've got to be consistent. Now, in many ways, we live in a very cheap recognition culture where people just get recognized for showing up. I am not talking about that. I'm not talking about getting, recognizing people for doing their jobs. I'm talking about recognizing them for going above and beyond the call of duty. And in your recognition, you need to be specific. I had a guy who used to pull me aside at the end of a week. He'd say, Eric, I really like when you did what you did over here on Wednesday. That th one thing right there was really awesome. And I was like, yes, yes. Just that specific recognition. And it was personal to me, right? So when I got marketer of the year, that was impersonal. But then when I worked for another company and I got a plaque with the specific amount that I sold, first thing I did is I ran home with that and said to my wife, let's put this on the wall in the office. You know what I mean? Because it was specific to me. Who in your organization needs recognition? Someone who you haven't spoken to perhaps in a while. Someone, if you're the leader of the company, you go by and you specifically recognize them for the work that they do. It would have a tremendous impact upon them. 
Because I'll tell you this, in a competitive culture, what people are looking for is they're looking for a place to belong. And I want to encourage you, in your organization, it's your culture that will keep the best people. Your culture will keep the best people over time. And the best organizations are those who specialize in recognizing high performers appropriately. So think about how people like to be recognized. Some people are humiliated if they're brought up in front of a bunch of people. It makes them uncomfortable. Other people love the spotlight. Some people just want a quiet conversation. Just look them in the eye. You don't even have to give them any money. You just look them in the eye and you have that quiet conversation with them. Those things stick with people for years and years and years. So as you're grabbing your ear and you're thinking about encouragement, accountability, and recognition, you need to go to your org chart and you need to think about who specifically needs recognition and put an R next to their name. Back to the Battle of Trafalgar. You have the Spanish and the French with Napoleon lurking on the continent, looking to invade Britain. And you had Admiral Nelson. And they took that new approach, right? Instead of going side by side, they took a diagonal approach. And they entered into the battle. 21 Spanish and French ships were destroyed. Zero British ships were lost. Zero. But there was one thing that was lost. And that was the life of Admiral Nelson. He died in the battle. Right? He gave up his life to win that battle. Think about how much you've sacrificed in your life to build the construction company that you have built. If you choose to want to continue that on and to perpetuate that legacy past generation one to generation two to generation three, it's going to be as a consequence of the strength of your leadership. And my conviction is specifically in the strength of your communication skills. And if you take one thing away from this conversation here today, it is to simply grab your ear and to understand that your job as a leader is to encourage people, it's to hold them accountable, and then to recognize them. Anyone know what this is called? This is Nelson's column. Talk about a legacy. Every time you go into London, right? The National Gallery is right by here. If you've never been to the National Gallery, you've got to go. It's awesome. British Museum around the corner. That's awesome, too. Um, House of Commons with the London Eye. Got to go there, too. Okay, free tips. But there, in Trafalgar Square, Nelson's column. He had a legacy as a result of his leadership. Right? What we do today has an impact for generations to come, for better or for worse. Think about the quality of your leadership at the moment and the quality of the messages that you're communicating to the people that report to you. If you're going to cement your, your, your legacy, make sure that you're focused on those three messages, which, which is encouragement, accountability, and recognition.